This video is sponsored by Brilliant. If you stick around until the end, I'll give you a link to get 20% off a premium membership. The voice of protest is the voice of the people. From Howard Zinn to Angela Davis, thought leaders and activists across the world have understood that protest is not just some march, a mere inconvenience for commuters, but instead a necessity for the fight for freedom, to make people's voices heard. Roughly 7.6 million people took to the streets all over the world in September to make that voice heard, to urge governments to look towards the evidence to look towards the future and to understand that a climate crisis is upon us. But how did we get here? 7.6 million is a significant number, and the strikes are part of a larger string of actions that have turned the world's gaze towards the problem of climate change. And the momentum only seems to be growing, with another potential global climate strike slated to counter the industrial gluttony of Black Friday. So with these realities in mind, I want to take a look at the current state of environmental protest, understand its impact, and figure out what's the next step after this newest explosion of climate strikes. The climate strikes aren't asking you to go vegan or change your light bulb. They're saying that's the baseline at this point, and we have to look further to hold our elected officials accountable. That's Jerome Foster II, founder and editor-in-chief of The Climate Reporter, founder of One Million of Us, as well as a climate strike organizer for Fridays for the Future in Washington, D.C. Needless to say, Jerome has his hands in a lot of climate action pies in the D.C. area. On top of all of this work, he also happens to be a senior in high school. In many ways, Jerome seems to echo the mold of many youth activists that have taken a stand against the reluctance of world figureheads to act strongly and ethically on climate change. He's young, and he's tired of global climate inaction. And this new wave of climate activists seems unwavering. They're lit by a fire of frustration, a fire that many point to Greta Thunberg for igniting. Young people all over the globe have been walking out of their schools every Friday to pressure their governing bodies to create bold climate action plans. This youth-led movement known as Fridays for the Future continues to build as young activists like Jerome start to establish themselves as serious organizers across the globe. But to believe that the current protests are solely due to the workings of Greta Thunberg would be folly. Thunberg is a piece of the puzzle but a leader does not make a movement. The September climate strikes, and for that matter, prior environmental actions like those aiming to prevent the construction of the Keystone XL and Dakota Access pipelines, were the product of thousands of hours of hard work done by people at every level, especially communities of color and indigenous communities. The environmental protest continues to forge a path towards an ethical coexistence with and on this earth through the interwoven efforts of activists like Jamie Margolin, founder of Zero Hour, Wanda Culp, an indigenous activist fighting to protect the Alaskan Tongass from logging and industrial use, or the 20 environmental and land rights activists murdered in Brazil in 2018 including those with Brazil's landless workers movement who were shot dead because the group was deemed a terrorist organization. So the state of environmental protest around the globe is one that seems unprecedented. Cities and local movements are interconnecting in solidarity. From Nairobi, Kenya to Melbourne, Australia, a loud rallying cry has been sounded to shake the world into overdrive, asking simply that their governments take action to mitigate the climate crisis. But are governments listening? Has this new slew of climate protests been effective? And when it comes down to it, can we really know for sure? Lily Gardner, a Kentucky-based organizer from the Sunrise Movement, thinks the protests and actions have had an impact on how politicians and citizens view the growing climate crisis. You might recognize her from this action in Mitch McConnell's office. As to like change that has been coming out of the protests, I think the fact that we even see a CNN town hall that's entirely dedicated to the climate crisis, that presidential candidates are opening their remarks at debate with 
mentions of the climate crisis that we've made it on the front page of the New York Times. I think those very public pronouncements and integration of the climate crisis into people's consciousness is something that we hadn't seen before the strikes. In many ways, I too feel this hope in the U.S. These new mass demonstrations seem to actually be pushing the mainstream towards a more aggressive stance on climate action. But I'm simultaneously wary that I'm viewing this apparent momentum with rose-tinted glasses. According to the International Center for Nonprofit Law, U.S. state governments continue to push for bills that would criminalize protesting near pipelines and quote-unquote critical infrastructure. With even more egregious legislation like South Dakota's recently passed SB 189, that would allow the state to go after quote-unquote riot boosters or protest funders for aiding in any disruptive protest. Across the country, over 100 bills attempting to restrict protests have risen to the fore in recent years. While legislators have struck down many of them, 16 anti-protest bills were enacted. But elsewhere, the recent climate strikes seem to be shaking the system at its core. Thanks to the highly publicized actions of groups like Extinction Rebellion, the United Kingdom declared a climate emergency, with countries like Austria, Spain, and Argentina following suit. With over 1,000 climate emergency declarations across local and national jurisdictions, the pressure of protests seem to be pushing global governments to recognize the necessity for climate action. But of course, many of these declarations are non-binding. So much like the Paris Agreement, we'll have to see whether these pronouncements actually create tangible change. Understanding that this mass mobilization of climate activists is just a start then, is important. The momentum and desire are there, but shaping the raw energy of 7.6 million people around the world into an actual transition from a carbon-reliant capitalist world to one of economic, social, and climate justice will be difficult. Jerome Foster wants to channel the energy of marches into a strong voting bloc with his One Million of Us campaign. The only reason politicians really care about anything is if they get money from it or if they get votes from it. So young people really don't have that much money to put into a system, but they have a lot of votes. So One Million of Us is to is an initiative to re-engage young people on every level from presidential elections to Senate, Senate elections to congressional elections to teach them about the importance of why they should vote and how they can vote. But as he admitted to me, the way that this movement continues to be successful is if adults join the struggle. Adults have to join. We have to be bigger than just saying like young people are fighting for their future because it's not our future and it's not just young people. If we were gonna replace elected officials, we need someone to replace them with like AOC or like Ilhan Omar and like really big champions of the environmental movement. Meanwhile, Lily Gardner seeks to continue to mobilize young people across the US. We are hoping to enter an era in which students across the world are taking active action in the name um, or in the face of the climate crisis. We're calling it in the United States Generation Green New Deal. We will not be Generation Z, the final generation. Instead, we're reclaiming this. We're becoming Gen G and D. Jerome and Lily reflect the countless approaches organizers are using to translate this growing movement into tangible policy and systemic change. The Green New Deal, in many ways, is a product of this renewed vigor of climate protests. As a proposal and as an idea, it frontlines the interconnected reality of climate change. It's not just about curbing greenhouse gases. It's about supplying meaningful jobs to thousands, improving infrastructure, and creating a just transition away from our current broken capitalist system. As we look towards the next couple of years wondering what we can do, we'll have to work hard to not only make individual changes, but more importantly, fight for global and structural changes that will inevitably be made possible by the loud calls of climate action movements. So what can you do? You can call your government officials, march, vote for strong climate action oriented candidates, take on the labor of educating people who don't think the climate crisis is important, and follow or financially support those doing the much needed work. And if you need inspiration for all of that, I put a list of activists in the description below. At the end of the day, mitigating global climate change is not an easy task. While recycling every piece of plastic you find is admirable, 
It won't change the global industrial system that continues to allow 36.2 billion tons of carbon into the atmosphere each year. To address this problem, we need tangible and courageous climate action led by those who are most affected by the climate crisis and supported by all of us. We are working to build freedom for all, which, as Angela Davis puts it, requires a constant struggle. According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, full-scale societal restructuring is essential within the next 11 years if we are to keep global surface temperatures below 1.5 degrees Celsius. But in order to do that, we'll need scientists, mathematicians, and engineers, among others, to help envision and create a world without emissions. Luckily, Brilliant is already teaching the next generation of problem solvers through an amazing selection of online courses that use interactive puzzles to hone critical, mathematical, and scientific thinking skills. Brilliant is a course-based website that lets you explore the realms of math and science through storytelling, code writing, and interactive quizzes which is exactly what you'll get when you dive into their Mathematical Fundamentals course. This course is awesome because you're not just sitting back and reading. Instead, Brilliant will guide you through the ins and outs of topics like number theory with engaging games and puzzles. Ultimately, if you're like me and always looking for new ways of understanding the world, or just simply want to explore topics like geometry or physics through interactive courses, then Brilliant is the way to go. So if you want to start developing your logical brain, Go to brilliant.org slash OCC or click the link in the description and sign up for free. As a bonus, the first 200 people that go to that link will get 20% off their annual premium membership. Hey everyone, Charlie here. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of the video. If you're interested in supporting the videos I make for this channel, consider backing me on Patreon. Even a dollar a month goes a long way to helping me out. Again, thanks for watching and I'll see you in two weeks.